This video is brought to you by NordVPN, the best online VPN service for speed and security. Check out the link in the description or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Hey everyone, and welcome back to High Speed Rail Explained, for the country you've all been waiting for, Germany. The German High Speed Rail Network is less of a network and more of a collection of lines, and Germany is facing an uphill battle while making strides towards a fully integrated national high speed rail system that will finally mean high speed rail lines that match the country's respected high speed trains. So let's dive in and see where things stand today and where they're headed for the future. Hey there, my name is Reese, and this is RM Transit, where we review the world's best and worst high-speed rail systems. The ICE or Intercity Express, Germany's foray into high-speed rail began in the 1990s, pre-reunification with the opening of a 280 km per hour line from Hanover to near Frankfurt. From the very beginning though, service went well beyond the boundaries of the proposed high-speed route, with trains running across the country from Hamburg all the way to Stuttgart and beyond. Germany is not an easy place to build a high-speed rail network, and to see why, you need only look at the geography. In Japan, most of the big cities can be connected in a line, and in France, a star topology lets you connect up the nation via Paris. But Germany has a bunch of large cities and potential journey combinations travelers might want to make, with cities sometimes located in clusters and lying outside of direct lines, and so they can't easily be connected up with only a few high-speed lines. You really need to build a mesh, which is not easy. This can be really hard to visualize, and for this, a simplified diagram of the country really comes in handy. I'll refer to this as the core network. As you can see, Frankfurt and Hanover are central to the whole network, with connections to international and regional cities happening through Hamburg, the rhine ruhr region, Karlsruhe and Stuttgart, Munich, and Berlin, which are all interconnected with intercity services of various speeds. For the rest of the video, I'll highlight connections both on the diagrammatic and geographical maps to help you better understand the network of today. There are some unique elements worth highlighting in Germany's railway network when it pertains to high-speed service. For one, tons of lines across the country have been upgraded to 200 km per hour, so many shorter distance journeys are fast. Unfortunately though, 200 km per hour lines limit speeds on longer journeys, and thus there's a need for far more true high-speed rail lines connecting the core network in particular. Fortunately, while substantial parts of the core network still need to be connected to dedicated high-speed lines, when you arrive in a city, it will basically always be in a historic city center station, or in some cases an upgraded city center hub. So last mile travel after getting off a high-speed journey tends to be convenient. The country also already has a very extensive regional and local rail system, arguably among the best in Europe, which already connects smaller cities that don't necessarily warrant a high-speed rail stop. So the ICE system is really the icing on the cake here. But the flip side of this is that owing to the large number of cities and rail connections in the core network and the density of Germany's cities, high-speed lines often end some distance from the city center, forcing trains into older, more congested legacy urban approaches, making the last leg in particular slow and often unreliable. So with that out of the way, let's look at today's high-speed rail network. Germany's purpose-built high-speed rail lines, in addition to the original line mentioned, include a 280km per hour line from Mannheim to Stuttgart, 250km per hour lines from Hanover to Berlin, and Wendelian to Ulm. There's also a number of 300km per hour lines that connect Cologne to Frankfurt, and from Ingolstadt north of Munich, and Leipzig via Erfurt. This means newly built, dedicated high-speed lines in the country are mostly restricted to a few north-south corridors, and new line construction is slow because of a policy of designing high-speed rail lines for freight use, requiring relatively flat alignments that force lots of bridges and tunnels, and other unusually onerous technical standards. These are probably also in part because of Germany's fairly notorious nimbyism. Fortunately, the upgrades I mentioned earlier are not only limited to 200 km per hour, and Germany has managed to upgrade a number of lines to 230 km per hour and beyond. These upgrades can be deceptive, as they're often composed of a mix of new sections of line and upgraded older sections. Both the Hamburg-Berlin and Munich-Augsburg corridors have seen line upgrades to 230 km per hour, while 250 km per hour upgrades have been executed on the Cologne-Aachen, Mannheim-Offenburg, and Offenburg to Basel corridors connecting up the northeast and southwest of the country with high-speed lines. As it turns out, many of these new and upgraded lines have allowed ICE services to spread internationally into other countries, with excellent high-speed services running from the rhine ruhr region to Brussels, the southwest to Paris, and the southeast to Vienna. There are also other international ICE services running to Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Basel, Zurich, and Innsbruck, although these are mostly extensions of fast domestic services. 
I also want to point out that, as usual, Switzerland likes to remind people that train delays often originate internationally, including in Germany. Essentially, the German high-speed rail network is not an entirely new railway, but the addition of new high-speed lines and upgrading of existing lines on Germany's national network. Unlike in France or Spain, where high-speed trains spend far more of their time on dedicated high-speed rail infrastructure, even close into city centers. Looking into the future, new lines and upgrades are currently being built, including bringing the Hanover to Berlin line up to 280km per hour and majorly upgrading the Karlsruhe to Basel route in the Rhine Valley. There are also a ton of planned lines which will help to expand the network and fill gaps. These include a 250km per hour line from Ulm to Augsburg to connect the existing line to Munich, and 300km per hour lines from Frankfurt to Mannheim to connect the existing rail services to the south, Hanover to Bielefeld to begin to connect the rhine ruhr region from the east, a nuremberg Würzburg line connecting across the country, and a new set of high-speed lines heading from Hamburg to Hanover and Bremen. There are also major upgrades ongoing on the line between Erfurt and Munich. Further afield, the Brenner Base Tunnel's construction will create relatively fast lines between southern Germany and northeastern Italy, which make up part of Europe's plans for an expanded continental freight network, while the new Fianmarn Belt Tunnel and associated 200km per hour lines to Copenhagen and Hamburg will connect those cities in around three hours. There are also plans for new links into urban areas, including more high-speed lines right into Frankfurt. The Wendlingen to Ulm line, which connects up to Zurich, is also being connected with a new high-speed rail line into Stuttgart, as part of Stuttgart 21. Stuttgart 21 is a set of major projects for Stuttgart that are supposed to be coming to completion in the next couple of years or so, consisting of a new shallow underground through station replacing the city's current stub end terminal, which is a really impressive project reminiscent of the Berlin Hauptbahnhof in some ways, with historic city center buildings put up on stilts right above four new giant island platforms and track areas, as well as flying junctions connecting to four new tunnels cutting under adjacent hills, which will make it easier for intercity and regional trains to pass through the city. Now, the project is highly controversial due to the need to cut down trees for it, as well as the demolition of part of the historic Stuttgart Hauptbahnhof. The project is also late and over budget, which doesn't help. But the bigger problem is the operations and infrastructure, which are optimized for frequency in a way that makes a lot of sense for S-Bahn trains, but less sense for intercity trains, especially as Germany moves towards a time transfer model like in Switzerland, with lots of distinct services. Anyhow, I'll be making an in-depth explained video about this and Stuttgart's rail network in the future, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. All of these different high-speed rail corridors will mean that Germany's core network will be fairly complete in the next few years, with the ability to travel all the way from Hamburg to Munich or Stuttgart to Cologne entirely on high-speed lines. However, there are still a number of gaps which exist. For one, improved links are needed into Berlin, Munich, and Frankfurt, where many lines converge and few high-speed rail lines actually terminate. Berlin should have links to Dresden and Erfurt, and probably a new 300km per hour high-speed line to Hamburg, while Frankfurt could likely benefit from a new high-speed southwestern bypass and other links, notably dedicated high-speed lines to Nuremberg and Erfurt, as well as a more direct route to Paris via Saarbrücken. The entire rhine ruhr area could also be better connected internally and with some other cities, including those in the Netherlands with a high-speed line, although there are some projects underway already in this region. The line south from Munich to Innsbruck, Austria is also rather indirect and would benefit significantly from new base tunnels, though those would not be inexpensive. Now, if you like German high-speed rail, the real reason is probably because of the beautiful white and red trains that crisscross Germany and their derivatives around the world, so let's look at what runs on the German network. The oldest trains to grace German high-speed rails were the locomotive-pulled ICE-1 and ICE-2 sets, which are capable of up to 280 km per hour and will still be in service for a while longer, although their aesthetics are rather dated. Along with the Swedish X2000, these trains were actually considered by Amtrak for use in America. Replacing those trains will in large part be the ICE-4, which was delayed in its debut in the 2010s because of production issues, and is a multiple unit train upgraded to be capable of around 260 km per hour. The lower top speeds are in large part a reflection of the many 200 to 250 km per hour lines on the German railway network, as Deutsche Bahn has found higher speeds actually reduce efficiency drastically. In some ways, the angular front nose of this train reminds me of the original ICE models, which is kind of a nice throwback. The other modern ICE model is the ICE-3 or Siemens Velaro high-speed EMU, which was introduced all the way back in 1999 and has seen numerous variants with different speeds, fit-outs, and electrification and signaling systems. 
but with a sleek enduring design and top speed of up to 330 km per hour that have kept it at the center of the German high-speed rail network. The Siemens Velaro has been a huge export success, with trains sold to Spain, Turkey, China, Russia, and the UK and France for use on Eurostar. And it seems its successor, the Velaro Novo, might be used on Brightline West, the new privately run high-speed line planned from Los Angeles to Las Vegas that I covered in a previous video. There's even a tilting model called ICET, and yes, I am so tempted to say Ice-T, and a diesel one known as the TD. Fortunately, when we put aside the somewhat lacking overall network, the actual policies implemented to drive people onto rail in Germany are quite interesting. For one, additional taxes applied to flights have increased their costs, while at the same time, the now famous 49 euro ticket, even though it doesn't cover ICE services, has gotten people on the railways in big numbers, and I imagine this will be a rising tide lift all boats situation. The less famous bond cards offer various discount rates on long distance services across Germany, and even flat rate travel with the bond card 100. That being said, historically ICE trains have had expensive fares, although these days if you book early they aren't quite so bad. In recent years, Deutsche Bahn has even started doing code sharing agreements with airlines, making combined air rail travel simpler than ever and perhaps even more interestingly, at Germany's main international gateway airport, Frankfurt, there are a massive number of ICE services that call here, providing a similar, albeit much more modest effect to Amsterdam Schiphol, and serving international flights to a huge area. So with that, we have Germany's high speed rail. A network that is a work in progress, but with good bones and huge potential for the future. It'll be exciting to see how far it comes in its next several decades. Now, with travel restrictions mostly lifted across the world, I've got big plans to travel to cities all over the place to bring you interesting content from Europe, Asia, Oceania, and more. I'm actually planning a trip right now to a big city in a few months time, and finalizing travel plans to see some very cool transit projects. This is where today's sponsor NordVPN comes in. I always like to travel with a VPN ready on my devices, and Nord has been a stable presence for the last couple of trips I've taken. I use Nord to stay protected when I'm using public Wi-Fi, and I'm able to connect to a server back home in Canada to access apps and websites that aren't available or aren't regularly configured wherever I am. And of course vice versa when I'm actually home to any of Nord's 5600 plus servers in 59 countries. With a single NordVPN subscription, I can also get access on up to 6 devices at once on every major platform, so I don't have to worry about being able to access internet safely on my work MacBook, Android phone, or other personal devices. And now NordVPN even offers a proxy browser extension, which means I can browse the internet safely and enjoy the comforts of home and threat protection even if I'm on a public device abroad, without the hassle of needing to download an app and allowing me to choose which websites I want a VPN to connect to. As you're probably aware, my full-time career is on the internet, and so it's even more crucial that I can get my work done safely no matter where I am. NordVPN comes with threat protection, an advanced anti-malware feature that blocks intrusive ads and web trackers so that my content, my business, and myself can stay safe and I can keep bringing you new content. NordVPN even comes in handy before the trip is booked. Since travel and ticket booking websites can see your cookies, location, and where you're booking from, they can artificially jack up the price. And with Nord, you can simply change to a different country and save with a single button press. Go to nordvpn.com slash rmtransit to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. A special thanks to Callum, Eustace, the rural urbanist Catalin, and the Martins for their help with footage and fact-finding for this video. 